Hey everybody, this is Hercules Pedics, founder, curator, docent, and gift shop employee of the Hercules Pedics Academy of Comic Book Studies. Today we have a very special episode. It's uh, not going to be about cyberbullying or the dangers of microdosing. It's going to be about trading cards. And I know these aren't comics. Well, actually, some of them kind of are. But many of these trading cards have beautiful artwork by some of the greats of uh, comic book history. And I've always had a thing for trading cards. I've always liked little things. I liked little toys. I loved those little tiny army soldiers that were like a mil two millimeters high when I was a kid. And I love trading cards because they're almost like these uh, beautiful little pieces of art on a very tiny canvas. And uh, then in the 90s, everything exploded and there was all kinds of trading cards with original art by people like Bill Sankovich and just all this amazing stuff. So I just loved the format of getting tiny doses of art on a little card. Let's start looking at these. So Dinosaurs Attacks. This was a series made by Topps in the late 80s. Um, obviously an homage to Mars Attacks. Copying the gory subject matter of Mars Attacks. But in this instance, there's a time rift that has been opened. All the dinosaurs from the past have uh, come to the present and are raking havoc. And just eating people and eating animals, eating everything. So they're pretty gory, just like the original Mars Attacks. And uh, the artwork for the main cards is uh, penciled by pencils by Herb Trimpey. And the inks uh, and the painted finishes were by Earl Norum and Exno, the, the great underground, well, mini comic type uh, punk cartoonist. So kind of a weird combo there. As you can see, looks pretty good. The sticker, which I have one example of, is uh, these were drawn by Palma Vrides and Harold S. Robbins, two high potentates in the Church of the Subgenius, had amazing cartoonists. I wish I had more of these. I love both of those artists. and um, But I don't even know where I picked these up. I don't think I ever bought a pack of Dinosaur Attacks cards. A lot of these I just found. It was weird how trading cards would just be like detritus floating floating around. And uh, for example, a, lo a lot of these cards were promo cards that came in like magazines as a bonus. And this is a John Bolton, a Chromium card, advertising his new card set, which I think was all based on Interview with a Vampire. Love John Bolton. This was a Golden Age comic card set. This is the promo card. Start, um, well, it's called the Golden Age Greats or something like that. But this is a old Golden Age comic called Startling Comics, also Chromium. And this, I don't really need to explain is the amazing uh, Paolo uh, Serpieri, the amazing Italian artist known for his Druna comic. I believe this is Druna. <laughs> I, uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't think there's any commentary necessary on there. So those are all promo cards. Here's the backs of those dinosaur tax cards. They have some story, the checklist, and on the backs of some of these, I put other cards. So here we have a promo card for Simon Bisley's Melting Pot. Well, it wasn't just him. Kevin Eastman and Eric, uh, Eric Talbot. But nobody really cared that they were involved. It was all about Simon Bisley. A nice crazy chromium card. This is a really nice one. It's a chromium card of Madman by Mike Allred. Just, uh, I like how he uses the chromium. It's a... Uh, a nice little effect there. So next we're gonna skip over this next part, but I, I'm just gonna explain really quick. So cards were so hot, hot at the time that Jim Shooter's second comic book company, Defiant, they decided to premiere their Dark Dominion title with a zero issue that came in card form. You'd have to buy the cards and then put them in these you know, sleeves to read the comic. And as you can see, you know, uh, it's a nine panel grid, 
which makes perfect sense because the pencils are by Steve Ditko. And, you know, he loved his nine panel grids. And uh, I guess uh, uh, Jim Shooter wrote this, of course. You know, actually, this is Pencils and Inks by Steve Ditko. So um, we're going to look at this later because one day I really want to look at Dark Dominion. I thought it was a really interesting comic. At least I did at the time. So uh, just going to flip through this pretty quick, give you a little taste of it. But we'll come back to this whenever I look at Dark Dominion because this is essential. It's a crucial issue, you know, for the series, but it only appears in this form. I'm sure they would have reprinted it as a comic if Defiant lasted long enough, but they didn't. Makes me sad. I really liked it. I thought Defiant was doing some really interesting stuff. So after the story is over, then there's all these other cards that are like typical trading cards, you know, showing all the characters in this world. And a lot of these are not credited, but I'm pretty sure a lot of these are inked by other people. It's Steve Ditko pencils on all of them. But some of them definitely, I could tell, are inked by other people. The backs of the cards have, uh, you know, more info. Like that is definitely not Steve Ditko solo. But I couldn't find who did them. But maybe by next time I'll find that out on the internet. So uh, when we look at Dark Dominion in a few months, hopefully it won't be too long. We'll find out who inked Ditko. So these cards all came in the Vlad the Impaler comic book from Topps Comics. They were um, polybagged and these cards were inserted. There's the Esteban Morato cards, the great Spanish artist. He drew the comic. There's a Sam Keith subset. Oh, I'm sorry, just one Sam Keith. There's a... Uh, a Michael Mignola, Mike Mignola one. And then there's one of Zorro, because I guess they were planning a Zorro-Dracula uh, crossover. These, I am not sure who it is. It looks like a very old school artist. They didn't sign it. I can almost guess it's like Pat Boyette or something like that, but I don't know. And look at this on the backs. It makes a, a one big image. I guess they found a pencil drawing by Jack Kirby of a Dracula-looking figure, and they got Mike Mignola to ink it. I don't know if this has ever been uh, reprinted anywhere. It's really nice. A nice Kirby. Especially considering how later it is in his career. Jack Kirby wasn't a very good artist in the last, you know, few years of his life. But this looks nice. Now, these are cards from the actual first Dracula miniseries, which was drawn by Mike Mignola. Kind of put Mike Mignola's na name on the map. I mean, after Gotham by Gaslight. But this is like when he first did his like full on like heading towards Hellboy uh, art style. And here are the covers from the, the issues. He was a John Nyberg triptych. And these are the great Mark Chiarello. God, that guy, unfortunately, he's a really good editor. And so because he's such a, he was such a popular editor, he didn't draw anymore. But look how, he was so good. Such a good painter. I mean, he's up there with guys like Kent Williams and John J. Muff. Here's the backs of those cards, which show scenes from the movie that the comic was based on. And then we have a few more. Here's the other Mike Wiganola cover. It was a four issue miniseries. And here's another beautiful Mark Chiarello painting of Gary Oldman <laughs> as uh, Dracula. We have, I have some Jurassic Park cards. They had some really good art in these. So here we have a beautiful Arthur, Sa Arthur Adams dinosaur. We have uh, John Van Fleet, another great painter. And we have two Walt Simonson cards. I believe he did the covers for the comics, perhaps. Yeah, I should have mentioned that. There was a four-issue miniseries of Jurassic Park, and these came in them. I don't think I bought the comics. I think I just somehow found these cards. Then I have some one-offs here. Or, uh, I have There was a Mike Plug uh, card set. I would still love to own this. 
It was basically Mike Plu drew like, fifth, sorry, 40, 50 new paintings, mostly of monsters, just for this card set. So this is just a totally original, beautiful Mike Plu drawing. And then also there was the Frazetta card set. I think there was many Frazetta card sets. I, I, I wouldn't mind owning those either. Some nice Frazetta. Here's his uh, Battlestar Galactica art. I remember seeing this in TV Guide when it came out. And I, even as a little kid, I was like, that's Frank Frazetta. He's in TV Guide. Wow. Here's the backs of those cards. We get to see a little more Mike Plugart and some sketches of Frank Frazetta. So now I do have the complete set of this. These are so nice. It's the Jeff, uh, Jeff Jones card set. That's what it was called. This is before he, uh, they changed their name to Jeffrey Catherine Jones. Or she, I should say. I don't think she's a they. And these are just all of Jones's, uh, a lot of his paperback covers he did. All the fantasy art, art he did throughout the 70s and 80s. I never realized he was that prolific as a cover artist. These are all beautiful. These are so nice. And then on top of that, on the back of each card, you get a nice sketch. These are probably from the books he illustrated the interiors of or just from his sketchbooks. Pictures from Idol, his comic strip that ran in National Lampoon. Very strange choice, though. So each um, description of the card, it'll have a title. And it'll almost have this little poem. Facing the enemy, when arrows came, he would always think that he might be... Sorry, it's hard to read this with this... Uh, he would always think that he might be dying just this one time. They're just little things like that. I assume Jeff, uh, Jeffrey Catherine Jones wrote them. But I kind of, you know what I would have preferred? I would have preferred information about where this cover originally appeared. What what sci-fi paperback it was or fantasy paperback. Because they're, they're not that good, these little poetic descriptions. They're just kind of cryptic and whatever. So just more of this, guys. This is just a great card set. I haven't, I hadn't seen most of this stuff because I didn't have a lot of sci-fi paperbacks. Some more nice sketches. There's Elric. This is from Fafford and the Gray Mouser. I did own that book as a kid, and I'm pretty sure I picked it up just because the Jeff Jones cover. This stuff is so good. Looks like a Conan or a Conan knockoff. Yeah, at the very least, I would love the back of the cards to have the dates of when these appeared. Because you can definitely see there's different uh, moments in Jones's career being uh, shown. Oh man, such great stuff. I wonder if that's Solomon Kane there, Robert E. Howard's, Howard's uh, Puritan character. Such beautiful stuff. I remember that from one of his portfolios, I think. Or maybe from the studio book. But so many of these are totally were totally new to me. They still are. You know, I have no idea where they're from. I, I'm pretty sure they're all from paperback covers. And just getting the sketches on the back, I'm kind of sad that they use this tech, whatever that's called, this effect that kind of obscures the art a little. Because they're all beautiful sketches. I'd love to see them, you know, un, in a pristine form. God, that one's so good. You'll have to turn your head sideways on some of these guys. Sorry about that. Ah, oh, beautiful. 
And there's the last card, which is the checklist. Yeah, I must have, I guess, just bought a complete set of this at a convention or something. That was the beauty. Uh, cards died really quickly. And, like, a few years after their boom, you could just get, like, a whole set of some cool card thing like this for, like, four bucks in a plastic case. Oh, so here's a few more Jeff Jones cards. These are the Chase cards, which you probably can't see. It's a... They're, like, super holographic or something. And here's one more normal Jeff Jones card. So then I have... Uh, I don't know where I picked these up. I have six of the Bernie Wrightson's car, uh, cards, which I would love to have this series as well. They did a whole card series, just Bernie Wrightson uh, paintings. And I think he might have done some new art for it too, just like the Plug one. But there's some nice stuff. And there's the Frankenstein Chromium or holographic card, which you probably can't see. Uh, I don't know. But and, and this is kind of nice, though. The Jeffrey Jones chromium cards, or the holographic cards, they reproduce the actual painting on the back. So you get to see it, you know, for reals. Well, I guess this one Jeffrey Jones card I had, that's from Series 2. So now i got to track that down. Here's the backs of the Bernie Wrightson's cards. This is nice. On the back of that holographic uh, Frankenstein card, there's a... a Detail from his beautiful Frankenstein drawings. I'm going to check something out real quick. I wonder if there's a... Nope, oh, sorry, wrong page. Oh, I see. I should have done this earlier, sorry. Oh, I guess it's nothing biggie. Nothing big. But once again, even the backs of these uh, Bernie Wrightson cards have nice little sketches. In this case, it's the actual sketches for the painting, which is kind of cool. They show his, you know, layouts. Now we have another Topps comic book. Topps started their own comic book company in the 90s during the big boom. They put out some interesting stuff, this being one of them. So Topps Comics was run by... Uh, an old Marvel guy. I'm sorry, the name's escaping me right now. Jim Salakrep. So he was an old school guy. So as editor in chief of Tops, with all this Tops money behind it, he tried to he tried to do some really cool fanish stuff. For example, uh, kicking back a little to Jack Kirby. He basically, you know, this was the day and age where comics would sell so much you'd get huge royalties. So he went out of his way to develop all these. Um, unused Jack Kirby properties. Part of the reason was just knowing that like, hey, Jack Kirby's old and he never got paid uh, commensurately to what he was worth. So we're gonna put this shit out and it's gonna give him some royalties at least. The first of these comics was called Satan Six. I don't know if he developed these characters for animation or what, but they were sitting in his notebooks. Here's the characters. Brian Blue Dragon, that's the original Kirby drawing. In the comic, he looks nothing like that. Desira, and I believe this is Brian Stelfreeze. Let me double check. Yes. She's kind of like the blonde, uh, the ditzy blonde of the group. That was her <laughs> character trait. This is Dr. Mortius. Let me see if, uh, I forgot this guy, this art. Oh, it's Brian Bolland, of course. So these cards got some heavy hitters on them. Sam Keith doing Frightful, who's this demon. Dave Gibbons doing Hard Luck Hardigan, Harrigan. And Frank Brunner doing Kuga, coming out of uh, retirement, kind of. He hadn't done a comics in years at that point. So these all came in the comics, polybagged. And these did as well. The comic was drawn by this guy, John Cleary. Uh, he was basically, his whole career was based on ripping off Todd McFarlane, but making it more cartoony. And he did a few comics for Image, even. And here is the, uh, the, the fancy chromium card of an original Jack Kirby drawing. drawing. 
So then Topps Comics really went all out and put out like a, almost like a Kirby verse. And it was called the Secret City Saga. And the three main heroes who all got their own solo, solo title were Captain Glory, Night Glider, and Bombast. These are the original Kirby sketches with some cool chromium card effect going on. Here they are again. And these are, I can't pronounce this guy's name. Let me, I think uh, it's on the back here. It's like Ted Boothkinet. Let me, let me see. Ted Boothkinet. <laughs> That's the closest I can get. So he painted these depictions of the three main characters. And then they had cards of all the villains and all the various characters from the original Jack Kirby sketches. Secret City, I bought all of those. It was kind of an interesting idea. And they got all these old school artists to draw it. The, John Severin drew one, Don Heck. It's almost like they were trying to recreate the Marvel bullpen from the 60s. I think Gary Friedrich wrote some of them. <laughs> these are also from Secret City. I guess uh, at one point, Clinton and Gore show up. But how cool is this? They got Angelo Torres, longtime mad artist, to do the caricatures of Clinton and Gore. <clears throat> kind of goofy looking, but still. They got John Byrne to do uh, a depiction of the main villain, Dr. Rogue. And here's some more uh, of the characters. This would be a spinoff. Part of the Kirby verse, Teen Agents. And uh, I think that's Brian Stelfreeze as well. Let me check. Maybe it says. Oh, th that's Adam Hughes. Here's Steve Ditko. And let me check another one. Oh, that's Jim Valentino doing Bob Best. And uh, these are some more of those artist series cards. Two by Stephen Hickman, really great fantasy artist. And this one I want to track down, the Mike Kaluta card set. They did a whole set of Mike Kaluta art. It was this company called FPG that did these high-end trading cards of like Frazetta and Boris and all these great fantasy artists and comic artists. They were definitely like the Cadillac of uh, trading card companies. I have a one-off promo card of Mars Attacks, just because it has nice Simon Bisley art. Yet again, another Topps comic book. And then this is the last vestiges of my Marvel Masterpieces collection. At one time, I owned all of the Marvel Masterpiece cards. And, you know, there I think the first set was all drawn by... What's that guy's name? Was it Bob Larkin? Some other painterly artist. He did every one. And they're nice. But, you know, I just got bored of them. But the second uh, Marvel Masterpieces had uh, other subsets, other artists. And so I kept the two Sankovich cards, just because I fucking love Sankovich. And getting any art by him is always nice. And then look at this. They had a little subset, a Golden Age subset by Jim Steranko, a triptych of Human Torch Captain America Namor. This is fucking gorgeous. This is so nice. I have some other one-offs. This is a promo card for the Godzilla trading card set. It's a little uh, chromium action going on. This is from the Joe Jesco card set. And uh, this is a beautiful Dave Stevens drawing of Vampirella from the Topps trading card set of Vampirella. Probably just a promo card again. Here's the backs of those Marvel Masterpieces. They had pretty nice backs. They actually would have decent information. Oh, here's a promo card from uh, the Rocketeer movie card series. And now we start with one of the nostalgic prides and joys of this collection. I love these stickers when I was a kid. I don't know if you guys are old enough to remember these. I believe they came out in like 76, 77, maybe even 75. There were these stickers of all the Marvel superheroes, but they'd be saying stupid uh, jokes. <laughs> Support your local thunder god. Who said blondes have more fun? 
only my hairdresser knows for sure. A lot of these are very dated. They're Half of them are from commercials, just like that one. That, that was a popular commercial when I was a kid. I'm Natasha, fly me to Miami, another commercial. Fly the friendly skies of United. So um, I, I remember as a kid, I, these really blew me away because they had really obscure Marvel characters. You know, every kid knew who Spider-Man was and Thor, even Thor and Doctor Strange. But you know, that the fact that they had Jim Starlin's Captain Marvel and Barry Windsor Smith's Conan and s some of the minor players in the Marvel Universe, like Hawkeye, who was my favorite superhero as a little boy. The Hulk is saying, who stole my right guard? <laughs> I forgot how many of these are just based on uh, dumb commercials. I like calls just saying, these pants don't fit. It's kind of sad looking at these knowing that the original artists didn't get a fucking penny for this shit. It's their art. They just took the art from the comics. <clears throat> That's some nice Gil Kane Morbius there. He's just so dumb. <laughs> Man thing. I dropped the soap in the shower. <laughs> oh, God. I remember this car just blew me away. That perfect Romita pose. Shanghai, master of Kung Fu. All aspirin is not alike. It, it's a total non sequitur, but obviously that was a commercial of the day. Of the day. Yeah, some of the superiors get two, two stickers. Thor looks like has three. Yeah. I think there might have been two series of these stickers. And uh, I wish I had them all. I have a bunch here, but there, there was way more than that. Next up, we got the trading cards that came with the Ray Bradbury comics that uh, Topps put out, Topps Comics put out. And they, there was some great stuff in those. We're going to definitely take a look at those one day. But I saved all the cards because they have, some of them have original art that's not in the comics, I think. And we have a, a nice Al Williamson panel from one of his stories, his Ray Bradbury adaptations. This one's really interesting. It's a lost piece of Al Williamson art. Apparently, Topps Comics was uh, going to do this like weird thing like candy coins called Leaping Lizards. And this is back in the 60s. And they got Al Williamson to draw some pterodactyls for the box, the thing that the candy would come in. And it was in their vault, and they found it. Kind of neat. He was a... Uh, Kenneth Smith, longtime uh, comics journal blowhard, uh, but a great artist doing a beautiful homage to Ray Bradbury. Really nice little piece of artwork. Um, this one I have to check. Sorry about that. I should have looked that up before. Actually, it doesn't tell, tell who the art's by. So I would guess it's Matt Wagner, because there was, even though it doesn't look like Matt Wagner, but he did a story in one of those Ray Bradbury comics and stories. <clears throat> Beautiful William Stout dinosaur drawing, John J. Muff, and again, Kelly Jones. And I think this is that Ted, Ted Bukatawaka, <laughs> the unpronounceable name again. Boonthanacket. There you go. And so now we got some more. Uh, this was the cover of one of the issues. Another beautiful William Stout drawing. This is uh, Daniel Brereton. Kind of a unmistakable art style. And then, I guess I got a handful. This I really want badly. There was a William Stout uh, trading card series. And these next four... These are from that. Look at that great cowardly lion from Wizard of Oz. And that is just perfect. 
Uh, this is a promo card from the Joe Jesco Master Card Series. This was uh, some like, it was like the Skybox Master Series where they got basically five or six great artists and just gave them all subsets to create new characters. And I can't, I'm not sure, but this might be Dave McKeon. The artist in this, uh, it was called the Creator's Edition. Julie Bell, Brom, Dave Dorman, Dave McKeon, and Brian Stelfreeze. And they were all new images made just for this series. And so now, guys, I can't get rid of this. I have barely any X-Men comics left in my collection. I don't really care that much about the X-Men. But this first Jim Lee drawn X-Men series, I just, I don't know why, something about it, I fucking love this. It brings out the total nerd in me. And like, I love how it's so like well-organized. Like, you know, they knew that every nine cards would fit a page. So they do the teams, team by team breakdown. And they all, you know, in nine cards, all the characters in each team, Excalibur, the backs have all the nerdy information you could ever want, even their powers. Energy projection, mental power, strength, fighting ability, intelligence. We get X Factor. And every single one's drawn by Jim Lee at his uh, superhero heights. I just, just think Jim Lee's just a perfect superhero artist. I know he's not that great compared to some cartoons, but... You know, if I'm if you're 14 and you want to read a comic, a superhero comic, yeah, I want that art to be by Jim Lee or Young John Byrne or Neil Adams or George Perez. I don't know. They're all good. This is when the X Men had split off into two teams: the blue and the gold team. I had such a crush on Psylocke. I still think she's hot as hell. God, I'm so lonely. <laughs> this was the, the yellow team, which nobody liked as much because they didn't have Wolverine in it. Oh, and then this beautiful image here. Nine cards that uh, fit together to make one big uh, splash type page. And I thought that was so wicked cool, that Wolverine, the position he's in. I mean, he corrected. When these came out, I was already a full-grown man, too. It's not like I was a teenager who, you know, gobbled this stuff up. But I still thought this was wicked cool. I, I hadn't read X-Men in years. But I got all these cards. Just because, like I said, I kind of have this fetish for trading cards. I, I fucking love them. Now we got all the villains. All in alphabetical, alphabetical order. There's an early Deadpool... Look at that. And this is one of the reasons, supposedly, why Jim Lee got pissed off from Marvel. Things like this, where he did all the artwork for this, this sold because Jim Lee drew them all. Sure, people like the X-Men, but this was getting 100 new images by Jim Lee at the height of his career. That's, that, that's what made this thing sell in the millions of copies. Well, maybe not millions, but a lot. It sold a lot. It was one of the most popular trading card sets at the time. So more villains. Very hot white queen. It's weird looking at these. I almost want to read the X-Men. They're just such a... They created such a vast populated world of crazy characters over the years. Mainly Chris Claremont. But of course, then when I do read them, I'm usually just like, oh, God, I don't want to read this. And now we have, like, allies, ex-X-Men. God, that's fun. And there's the checklist, card 100. So this is kind of goofy. So when I was in high school, I made these God trading cards. I only made two. 
It says 1984 copyright tops. So <laughs> good thing they didn't sue me. Cod has agreed to appear on a new line of trading cards. Each pack comes with a host cracker. Collect all 15. I only made two. For some reason, I started drawing this guy in high school, and I, you know, I thought that's what God looked like. And then I'll skip ahead to the back. And here's God shooting the tubes at Jones Beach. And there's God surfing. If you can see it, it's kind of faint. I didn't even ink them, so they're slowly fading over the years. Now, these are amazing. So I had these, you know, when they came out in 76, I was probably eight or nine. And I was the, wasn't even into skateboarding. But I could tell that this artist was a, a comic book artist of some sort. Comic booky. Now, all these years I've had these. And every now and then I'd take them out and flip through them and be like, wow, who's this cartoonist? He's really good. And like, it almost looks like there's some frizzetta ness going on. But then, guys, look at this helmet right here. Take an educated guess who this could be by. I just found out today. My good friend Jason Willis from Tucson, Arizona. Amazing graphic designer. He's very good at looking up things on the internet. I could not find any article about who drew these things. And so I asked him to get on the case. And due to his amazing cyber sleuthing, in you know, just a few hours, he sent me back the name of who drew all these stickers. It's Alex Nino. Look at that. How could I have not known that helmet? That helmet is so Alex Nino. It's definitely Alex Nino, you know, slicking his heart up. But look at that. That is so Alex Dino. That weird planet in the background. So these stickers just had all this kind of cool imagery. I really wish I had them all because they're all wicked looking. Some of them even have this Kirby influence, which I think uh, Nino did intentionally. And uh, you can see a little in this one, but there's other ones that really look like he's like uh, doing an homage to Kirby. But for the most part, you can really see the Alex Nino coming through. So once again, thanks, Jason. Uh, if you guys uh, are fans of those eerie publications from the 70s, uh, Jason designed a wonderful uh, book about the whole history of uh, that comic book company. They're the guys that did those horrible and <laughs> horrific uh, black and white war knockoffs in the 70s. And... Jason's always had a soft spot for him, and now he gets to, uh, he basically made the Bible about that company. So I uh, track it down. It's really good stuff. And so then I guess after a while, they started making like widescreen cards, and I got a few promo ones. Of course, you even have to get different sheets, uh, holding sheets for them. These are Sandman cards which actually look pretty good. Lots of Dave McKeon art in them. I wouldn't mind owning those. There's another one. And then I got this promo card for Kingdom Come. A beautiful Alex Ross drawing of Superman there. So that's it for this first. Ah, let me get this over there. There we go. This is the first book I have, but I have another one. And this one is all one thing. I have the complete collection of toxic high trading cards. Now, I don't know if you guys are familiar with these. These are from the 90s when everything was extreme and uh, things were opening up a little. And uh, I believe they're in 1991, it says, yes. So these were all drawn by Drew Friedman. Look how beautiful every one of these are. And as far as I know, these have never been reprinted. So this is the only way to get basically 99 pieces of beautiful Drew Friedman art. And basically, it's very like um, mad-inspired humor. Good mad-inspired, like early mad. Very, uh, you know, uh, anti-authoritarianism going on. Lots of the students who have died <laughs> just make these jokes about these dead students.
And here's the backs of them. The backs have all this funny stuff too. Well, the first two are just checklists. But um, yeah, so these are almost like mini little mad articles. Just really funny stuff. And I think maybe Tomas Bunk drew some of these backs. I think Drew Friedman didn't draw many of the backs of the cards. But it's a lot of those great tops artists like Bunk. So it's just making fun of all aspects of high school life. The school nurse, hygiene class, school chef. He puts a little bit of himself in every meal. And then the backs have all these great funny little mini articles. I am so happy I picked these up. God, somebody should reprint these in a, you know, book form. These are just too good to not be out there. God, your Friedman's so good. <laughs> the coach is a transvestite. This is really like, I mean, kind of, a, some of it's kind of adult humor. Well, at least, you know, adolescent, older adolescent humor. Sorry about all these sideways ones, guys. You know, just have to tilt your head. The Acne Club, <laughs> that is so Drew Friedman. He draws every pustule on their faces. Just all this great stuff on the back. Full color. I should have looked up who drew these, but I'm almost positive Tomas Bunk is one of them. And so the card, that's just the cards. And then they came with this subset of all these little mini stickers. And these are all just beautiful Drew Friedman. Uh, just black and white art. Cutest smile. It's Bazooka Joe. A little uh, shout out to the fellow Topps Comics uh, character. I'll flip this upside down so you can see the other characters. Most chosen, and they see this guy, this guy who looks like a Hasidic Jew. <laughs> Just so weird. That's such a great character. Heaviest date. And then the backs have little uh, facts about these uh, these weirdos. God, I should have got a second set of these. I would love to plaster these stickers everywhere. We got some more of these mutants. Future elevator man. Most unnerving stare. She's a Cyclops girl. <laughs> Biggest wimp. Looks just like Popeye. Let me make sure that's centered for you. And there's some more. This pinhead. God. This is so repulsive. True Friedman's going like full on Basil Wolverton on these. Little Walter Keen homage. Most misunderstood. And then we have... Some more. I would love to see these uh, reprinted just to have them, uh, just to have see them in a nice big size. Just think of all these amazing Drew Friedman illustrations that are just kind of lost. <laughs> I mean, I guess they've made a lot of these, but. <laughs> This one I thought was insane. Cutest couple. 
I was like, man, because, you know, these things are marketed to teenagers. It's almost like Topps was trying to be controversial and, like, almost wanted parents to get mad because they probably figured it would uh, boost their sales. And that's it. So this book just has these toxic high cards. And, oh, man, some really nice stuff. And I think he did another series for them, which I can't remember right now. Sorry. Uh, it could be a dream I had once. I don't know. But I think Drew Friedman might have a whole other goofy card set uh, done for tops. But, uh, yeah, I think, yeah, I'm not sure if that's real or I've just imagined that. So there you go, guys. Hope you enjoyed looking at all these goofy trading cards today. I, I got more, and I'm thinking about doing another one of these because I got some good stuff. Like I said, I got two sets of cards that are all original art from Bill Sankovich in his prime in like the late 80s. And I got Scott Shaw's Oddball Comics, which are fun as hell. Just finding the weirdest comic covers of all time and then making fun of them on the back of the card. And I got some amazing Madman cards where he gets almost everyone who's ever drawn in comics to do Madman. Frank Frazetta, Jack Kirby. Those Madman cards are kind of impressive. And other stuff. I can't think off the top of my head, but I think I'm going to look at those pretty soon. But maybe not. Maybe I'll look at them in a few months. Give it a rest. So I hope you guys enjoyed looking at these today. And uh, I hope to see you next time here at the Hercules Pedics Academy of Comic Book Studies.